Okay, we're going to do this. Let's see if it works. I want to uh, live stream the sealed nectar reading to see if it'll work to read longer portions of this book uh, because I got time. So let's see if we can record longer with a sealed nectar. Okay, and uh, let's see how long it'll work for. Okay, because sometimes uh, this phone will time out, but since I'm streaming it live and we're going to read it live, Let's see what we can do. If because sometimes we can do a longer reading today of the sealed nectar. Now that I know how to live stream, I can read this for a longer period. Okay, so we're on the sealed nectar and we're on page three fifty two, and we're starting on the top paragraph. He used to talk to his companions a lot about the merits, virtues, and divine reward implied in observing the prescribed worships and rituals. He would always bring forth supporting proofs in order to link them physically and spiritually to the revelation sent to him. Hence, he would describe them of their duties and responsibilities in terms of the consequence of the call of Islam, and at the same time emphasize the importance of comprehension and consideration. Look at that. The importance of comprehension and consideration. That's true. That was his practice of maximizing their morale and instilling in them the noble virtues and ideas so that they could become models of virtue to be copied by subsequent generations. Abdullah bin Masood once said, if you are willing to follow a good example, then you have an option in the tradition of the deceased because the living are likely to fall as easy prey to oppression so they might hesitate in faith. Follow the steps of Muhammad's companions. They were the best in this nation, the most pious, the most learned, and the least compromising. Allah chose them to accompany the Prophet, peace be upon him, and established his religion. Therefore, become familiar with their virtues. So, become familiar with their virtues. Follow their, ver their righteous way and adhere as much as you can to their manners and assimilate their biography, for indeed they followed unwavering guidance. There is then the great messenger of Allah, whose moral visible attributes, aspects of perfection, talents, virtues, noble manners, and praiseworthy deeds entitle him to occupy the innermost cells of our hearts and become the dearest target that the self yearns for. Those were the attributes and qualities on whose basis the Prophet, peace be upon him, wanted to build a new society, the most wonderful and the most honorable society ever known in history. On these grounds, he strove to resolve the long-standing problems and later gave mankind the chance to breathe a sigh of relief after a long, exhausting journey on the dark and gloomy avenues. Such lofty morale lay at the very basis of creating a new society with integrated components immune to all fluctuations of time. Look at that. Creating a new society that is going to be immune to all fluctuations of time. So it's going to be relevant and useful throughout all time periods. That's amazing. The whole course of humanity, exactly. Okay, now the new section says... Treaty with the Jews. Soon after emigrating to Medina and making sure that the pillars of the new Islamic community were well established, on strong basis of administrative, political, and ideological unity, the Prophet, peace be upon him, started to establish regular and clearly defined relations with non-Muslims. Oh. All these efforts were exerted solely to provide peace, security, and prosperity to all mankind at large, and to bring about a spirit of understanding and harmony within his region, in particular. Well, yeah, you have to do those kind of things, right? Look at that. The Prophet did that. Tolerance. Geographically, the closest people to Medina were the Jews, while harboring in certain intentions and nursing bitter feelings of resentment, they showed neither the least resistance nor the slightest hostility. The Prophet, peace be with him, decided to conclude a treaty with them with clauses that provide full freedom and faith and wealth. He had no intention whatsoever of following severe policies involving expulsion. 
Oh, like, okay, like if you like exp exposing people from, like they're not part of your faith and getting them out of the land. Interesting. Seizure of wealth and land or hostility. He had no intention of that. That's good. The treaty came within the context of another of larger framework relating to inter-Muslim relationships. The most important provisions of the treaty are the following. Wait, where'd it go? Oh, <laughs> the pages were stuck together. Sorry, family. I turned the page. Okay, number one. The Jews of Bani, Awolf, are one community with the believers. The Jews will profess their religion and the Muslim theirs. Two. The Jews shall be responsible for their expenditure and the Muslims for theirs. Fair. Three. If attacked by a third party, each shall come to the help of the other. That's a good that's a good policy if you think about it. Uh, four. Each party shall hold counsel with the other. Mutual relations shall be founded on righteousness. Sins is totally excluded. Five. Neither shall commit sins to the prejudice of the other. 6. The wronged party shall be aided. The wronged party shall be aided. So the one who is like truly being the one oppressed is the one who's going to get help. 7. The Jews shall contribute to the cost of war so long as they are fighting alongside the believers. Yeah, if you're going to fight with somebody, you got to help contribute, right? 8. Medina shall remain sacred and inviolable for all that join this treaty. Oh, that's a good clause, right? If it's super important for you to have, you know, peace in Medina and keep it sacred, you definitely have to have it in your contract pack, right? Nine. Should any disagreement arise between the signatories to the treaty, then Allah the All High and his messenger shall settle the dispute. Ten. The signatories to this treaty shall boycott the Quraysh commercially. They shall also abstain from extending any support to them. Wow, that's a good one. Yeah. So whoever signs on to this deal, you know, right? They got to not really trade with the Quraysh. Hit them in the economic point, right? Wow. And you, and not only do you hit this, they make it outlined so you can't do, you know, any trade with them. You no know, economic support. It's like, no, no military support either. You have to literally put them aside. 11. Each shall contribute to defending Medina in case of foreign attack in its respective era. Ooh. No, area. Sorry. Area. Wow. Defend Medina. So you sign on. You have some defense duties. 12. This treaty shall not hinder either party from seeking lawful revenge. It, okay, so... If you have lawful revenge, you're allowed to do it. I mean, that's unique. Not too many treaties have that, like a clause where you can, you know, not do that. That's interesting. Medina and its suburbs, after the endorsement of this treaty, turned into a coalition state with Medina proper as capital and Muhammad, peace be upon him, as president. Authority lay mainly in the hand of the Muslims, and consequently it was a real capital of Islam. To expand the zone of peace and security, the Prophet, peace be upon him, started to enter into similar treaties with other tribes living around his state. Interesting. Ooh, this section's titled, The Bloody Struggle. Ooh. And then the subtitle says, The Attempts of the Quraysh to Provoke the Muslims and Their Contact with Abdullah bin Ubay. Wow. I think we're going to get into it, family. Salam, salam. Yeah, this is good. The Quraysh offended at the escape of the Prophet, peace be with him, along with his be devoted companions, and jealous of his growing power in Medina, kept a strict watch over the Muslims left behind and victimized them in every possible way. Oh, that's interesting. Like, maybe because they're left behind, there were so few numbers, the Quraysh saw that opportunity and took advantage of it. They also established secret contacts with Abdullah bin Ubay ibn Salul, chief of Madanese polytheists. Okay, gotta write down, highlight his name. And head 
designate of the tribes Auz and Kajraj before the Prophet's immigration. They sent him a strongly worded ultimatum, ordering him to fight or expel the Prophet, peace be with him. Otherwise, they would launch a widespread military campaign that would kill his people and arrest his women. His pride wounded and kingship no longer his, Abdullah bin Ubay ibn Salul responded positively to his Kurishite co-polytheists. Abdur Rahman bin Ka'ab said, When this reached Abdullah bin Ubay and those who were worshippers of idols with him, they gathered together to fight against Allah's messenger, peace be with him. When the Prophet, peace be with him, heard about it, he visited them and said, the threat of the Quraysh to you has expired. They cannot conceive a plot against you more than you intend to harm yourselves. Are you willing to fight with your sons and brethren? That's a legit question to ask. It's a legit question. If It's hard to fight against your own sons and your own brethren, your kin, right? I mean, it's painful. No doubt. No doubt. When they heard this from the Prophet, peace be with him, they all left. Their chief, however, seemingly complied, no, complied, but at heart, he remained a wicked, unpredictable conspirator, along with Quraysh and the envious Jews. That's a little bit of bias writing. You could write it a little different. Uh, small fights and provocations started to pave the Muslims' way for a major confrontation between the Muslims and polytheists. Wow. Okay, the news section is title family says publicizing the intent for anonymity in the sacred masjid. Sa'ad bin Mu'ad, uh, an outstanding helper, announced his intention to observe Umrah, lesser pilgrims, and headed for Mecca. He went to Umayyah bin Khalaf and said, Tell me of a time when it is empty so that I may be able to perform tawaf around the Kaaba. So Umayyah went with him about midday. Abu Jahal met them and said, O oh, Abu Safwan, who is this man accompanying you? He said, He is Sa'ad. Abu Jahal addressed Sa'ad, saying, I see you wandering about safely in Mecca, in spite of the fact that you have given shelter to the people who have changed their religion and support them. By Allah, if you were not in the company of Abu Safwan, you would not have gone to your family safe and sound. Ooh. Oh. Okay, what's going down? Sa'ad, raising his voice, said to him, By Allah, if you should stop me from doing this, I will certainly stop you from something that is more valuable to you. That is your passageway through Medina. Interesting. Some tense conversation going on. Provocative actions continued, and Quraysh sent the Muslims a note threatening to put them to death in their own homeland. This Quraysh are still at it. Wow. Still at it. Those were not mere words, for the Prophet, peace be with him, received information from reliable sources, attesting to real intrigues and plots being hatched by the enemies of Islam. Precautionary measures were taken, and a state of alertness was called for. A state of alertness to be like totally village and aware. Calling your people to alertness is like to focus all their energy and attention on what's going down including the positioning of security guards around the house of the Prophet, peace be with him, and strategic points. Muslim recorded that Aisha, peace be with her, said that Allah's messenger lay down on bed during one night on his arrival in Medina and said, Where there is a pious person from amongst my companions, who should keep a watch for me during the night? Maybe the one who could, because uh, good at keeping watch at night, could be somebody who can uh, see well at night, and that uh, isn't you know can see far away. A good person for a night shift is also somebody who is does well under sleep deprivation. Definitely have to point somebody who's good with that. She said, "We are in this state when he heard the clanging noise of arms. He, the prophet, said, "Who is it?" He said. This is Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. Allah's messenger, peace be with him, said, What brings you here? Thereupon he said, I feared lest any harm should come to Allah's messenger, so I came to serve as your guard. 
Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, invoked blessings upon him, and then he slept. Well, imagine how wonderful that would feel if somebody came up to you and offered themselves to be your guard. I mean, that's pretty honorable if you think about it. I mean, it's amazing. I really like it. This state of close vigilance continued ceaselessly until the words of Allah were revealed, saying, Allah will protect you from mankind. Here the Prophet, peace be with him, peeped from the dome of his house, asking his people to go away. He, he said, O oh people, leave me, for indeed Allah the mighty and majestic shall protect me. The Prophet's life was not the only target of the wicked schemes but rather the lives and the whole entity of the Muslims. When the Madanese provided the Prophet, peace be with him, and his companions with safe refuge, the desert Boudins began to look at them all in the same perspective and outlawed all the Muslims. Whoa! The Madanese... Wait, the Madanese provided the Prophet and his clan with safe refuge? Wow, the, the desert Boudins, who are they? The Bedouins, who are they? They began to, wow, they began to outlaw all the Muslims. Who are they? I don't remember. Permission to fight. At this critical situation, with the Quraysh having the intention of pursuing their aggressive and uh, devilish plans, Allah, the All High, gave the Muslims the permission to take arms against the disbelievers. Quote, Permission to fight is given to those, i.e. believers, against those believers who are fighting them, and because they believers have been wronged, and surely Allah is able to give them believers victory. 2239. End quote. This verse was revealed in a larger context of divine instructions to eliminate all aspects of falsehood and hold in honor the symbols and rights of Allah. The symbols and rights of Allah. Quote, those Muslim rulers who, if we give them power in the land, they order for ikamatu salat, the five compulsory, they got too many parentheses, the five compulsory congregational prayers, the mills and mosques to pay the zakat, obligatory charity, poor due, and they enjoin al-muruf, and all that Islam, or, man, this is too many things. I don't know which is part of them. And forbid all Munkar. Make the Quran as the law of their country in all the spheres of life. Okay, he okay he can do the footnotes of like the Al Maruf, the Islamic monotheism, and all that Islam orders wants to do. Like that footnote in parentheses should could be at the bottom, because it's not. It's, it gives me the definition, but it messes up the sentence. I don't know. It's made me a little confused. Doubtlessly, the permission to fight was revealed in Medina after immigration, not in Mecca. Still, the exact date whereof is in doubt. Permission to fight after immigration. Oh, interesting. The permission to fight was already there, but in the light of the present state of affairs, it was wise for the Muslims to bring the commercial routes leading to Mecca under their control. To realize this strategic objective, the Prophet, peace be with him, had to choose either of two options. Ooh, let's see. One, entering into treaties with the tribes inhabiting either the areas adjacent to the routes or between these routes and Medina. With respect to this course of action, the Prophet, peace be with him, had already signed together with the Jews and other neighboring tribes the aforementioned pact of cooperation and good neighborliness. Wow, that's not mentioned a lot in history. And like, that's a good thing to know. Like, they really did have pacts of cooperation and neighborliness. Wow. It's almost like the Jews and the Muslims, they teamed up for a little bit. Like, not teamed up, but like, had an understanding. Two, dispatching successive armed missions for harassment along the strategic commercial routes so like for protection so like to protect trade okay the next paragraph says pre badr missions and invasions with a view to implement these plans the muslims started real military activities 
which at first took the form of survey patrols delegated to explore the geopolitical features of the roads surrounding Medina and others leading to Mecca, and building alliances with the tribes nearby. The Prophet, peace be with him, wanted to impress upon the polytheists and Jews of Medina, as well as the Boudins in its vicinity, that the Muslims had smashed their old fears and had become so strong that they could not be attacked without receiving any harm from them. Wait a minute. So the Jews of Medina, okay, Jews of Medina, the Boudins, attacked, receiving any harm, the Quraysh, Interesting. The Quraysh from committing any military folly against him, which might put in danger their economic life and means of living, and to stop them from persecuting the helpless Muslims detained in Mecca. Consequently, he would avail himself of this opportunity and resume his job of propagating the divine call freely. The following is a summary of these missions and errands. Okay. Divine call, missions and errands. Okay, the Quraysh still going at it. The Quraysh, crazy Quraysh sometimes. The Saiful Bahir mission. Ooh, let's see. It occurred in Ramadan 1 AH, i.e. 623 CE, led by Hamza bin Abdul Mutalib and compromising 30 emigrants with a different task of intercepting a caravan belonging to the Quraysh. Oh, what, what does it have? What are they carrying it? It was a caravan of 300 people, including Abu Jahal bin Hisham. The two parties encountered each other and aligned in preparation for fighting. Majidi bin Amr, on good terms with both sides, happened to be there and managed to prevent an imminent clash. On the occasion, the Prophet, peace be with him, accredited the first flag in the history of Muslims. It was white in color and was entrusted to Abu Muthad Kanaz bin Hussein al Ganawi, no, al Ganawi to carry. Wow. Okay, the first flag and it was white. The first flag. It was white in color and it was given to that guy to be trusted with it. He's the flag bearer. The first flag bearer family. Okay, two. Ooh. The Rabig Mission in Shawal 1H, no, 1AH, i.e. April 623 CE, Allah's Messenger, peace be with him, dispatched Ubaidah bin al-Harith bin al-Mutalib at the head of 60 horsemen of emigrants to a spot called Batin Rabi, where they encountered Abu Sufyan at the head of a caravan of 200 men. There was arrow shooting, but no actual fighting. Oh, could you imagine the arrows just coming down? <laughs> ah! Dang. It is interesting to note that two Muslims, al Miqdad bin Amr al-Bahrani and Utbah bin Ghazwan al-Mazini, defected from the caravan of the Quraysh. Oh, and joined the ranks of Ubaidah. Oh, snap. Defected. The Muslims had a white flag carried by Mista bin Athatha bin Al Mutalib bin Abid Manaf. Three. Ooh, another mission, yes. The Kaharar mission. It occurred in Duhul Qada, 1 I A H I E, May 623 CE. The Prophet, peace be upon him, dispatched Said bin Abi Waqas at the head of 20 horsemen, and instructed them not only to go beyond al Qarar, after a five-day march, they reached the spot to discover that the camels of the Quraysh had left the day before. Their flag, as usual, was white and carried by al Miqdad bin Amr. Interesting. Okay, then number four, bad life. The invasion of Al-Bawa or Wadan. It was a Safar 2 AH, i.e. 623 CE. Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, set out himself at the head of 70 men, mostly immigrants, to intercept a camel caravan belonging to the Quraysh. Leaving behind Said bin Ubada to administer the affairs in Medina, 
he reached Wadan without an incident. Well, that's good. Less drama, good life. In the process of this campaign, he contracted a non-aggression pact. Oh, pact with Amr bin Makshi Adamri. The provision of the pact goes as follows. Okay, let's see. So with him, Amr. So the process, the campaign, and a non-aggression pact. The libertarians have a non-aggression principle. Let's see if it's similar to this. This is a document from Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, concerning Bani Damra, in which he established them safe and secure in their wealth and lives. They can expect support from the Muslims unless they oppose the religion of Allah. They are also expected to respond positively in case the Prophet, peace be upon him, sought their help. This was the first invasion under the leadership of Allah's Messenger. It took 15 days with a white flag carried by Hamza bin Abdul Mutalib. Interesting. Safe and secure and wealth and lives. Oh. So support from the Muslims unless they oppose the religion of Islam. Interesting. And then they're expected to give aid when like needed if the Prophet asks them for some help. Seems legit, seems fair. Five, the invasion of Buwait. It took place in Rabiul Awal 2AH, i.e. 623 CE. The Prophet, peace be with him, at the head of a 200 companions, marched for Buwait to intercept a caravan belonging to the Quraysh, compromising 100 Quraishites, Umayyah bin Khalaf among them, and 2,500 2, camels. When he reached Buwait, the caravan had left. Before leaving Medina, he mandated Said bin Mudah to handle the affairs until his return. So when they intercept these caravans, are they, um, uh, what are, are they taking, like, are the, you know, not all of them are getting, uh, not all of them turn into battles, so are you just extracting, you know, a fee to pass, or are you taking some resources, letting them go? Or you just passing them and then making it so you can uh, get through. What do you think? I wonder. The invasion of Safwan. In Rabi ul Awal 2AH, i.e. 623 CE, Kurz bin Jabir al Fihri, at the head of a small group of polytheists, raided the pastures of Medina and looted some animals. The Prophet, peace be with him, at the head of 70 men, left Menina to fight the aggressors. He went into their pursuit till he reached a place called Safwan, near Badr, but could not catch up with them. This mission came to be known as the Preliminary Badr Invasion. Oh, okay. Interesting. During his absence, the Prophet, peace be upon him, entrusted Zayn bin Haritha with administering the affairs in Medina. The standard was white in color and entrusted to Ali bin Abi Talib to carry. Well, it's, it's cool that they mention who's the flag bearer. It shows you, like, that they valued, you know, the flag bearer. It's very unique. It's something uh, I've noticed a lot. So we'll cut this video off here, family. It's at the 28-minute mark. And I'm going to pick up a different book to read live. That way I can, you know, some books I'll still do shorter segments, like how I usually do, and some I'll read live. So um, I hope you liked it. Let me know what you think. We read quite a bit, longer than usual, and I'm going to go pick up another book and uh, drink some water, and I'll be back to record another video. Okay, family. Thanks for watching. You're all the best.